Greetings, this is Carol Clemens with Life Enrichment Ministries, and I just want to take some time this evening just to talk from my heart. I have just finished a counseling session. I do counseling uh, as a certified pastoral counselor. I do counseling Monday through Thursday afternoon and evenings. And my heart has is just really stirred. I know I posted just a couple of days ago, and excuse me, a, a teaching video that the world needs Jesus Christ. And our, our necessity of us to surrender to him. But as I counsel people, and I counsel all types of situations, I work with marriage and family, with people that have abandonment issues, with people that are suffering from fear and anxiety. And I'm talking about people that have had a relationship with God. Uh, I deal with pornography addiction. Uh, you go to my website, carolclemens.org, and you can go to the About page, carolclemens, C-L-E-M-A-N-S dot org. Go to the About page and read the process of my counseling and all of the subjects. If you scroll down to the bottom, you'll read all the different subjects that I counsel. But what is burning on my heart this evening? And if I come to tears, I call them Holy Ghost tears. Because what is burning on my heart this evening is the lack, it seems like, of even those of us that have been born again of water and spirit. We are not focusing our lives and our relationships on interacting with the Lord Jesus Christ in the sense of that we're accountable to God for everything. The Bible tells us from, genera from uh, excuse me, Genesis to Revelations that we're going to give an account to God for every idle word that comes out of this mouth. And I said in my last video that I did, I was reading from an article that I had written, and toward the end of the article, I made the statement. I said, if we all would totally surrender to God and allow the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians, the fifth chapter, we know the first three, love, joy, and peace. But are we allowing the fruit of the Spirit the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness and self-control. Are we allowing that to control our lives? We're supposed to give an accountability to God for everything that we do. I was thinking of parents. I've raised my children and we took at life's experiences as it teaches in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, that when you wake up in the morning, when you sit down, when you walk along the way, and when you go to bed at night, you teach the principles of God. And you say, well, how do I do that? You do it by the circumstances that are happening. And then you ask the question, what would God want us to do? I listen to American Family Radio, and um, in the afternoons on 2 o'clock, uh, there's a couple on by the name of Ad... Adkinson's, I think it is. It's a young black couple. They have a heartbeat for ministry. They have a heartbeat for the family. And they have six of their own children. They just had a new baby. And last week she was talking about, as a young mother, how she gets ridiculed because she will say to her children and she will say it to her peers when they're talking about dealing with family issues. And she said, when conflict comes up or something comes up, she said, I always say to my children, what would God want us to do? Now, if you have counseled with me before, you know that is a bottom line. I'm saying, what is God's truth about this? And, and my heart bleeds because as I deal with people nationwide, I'm counseling nationwide, Go to my website and you can get my phone number. And if you're interested, call and leave me a message and then I will call you back. But you read the about page on my website first. I counsel all types of situations, but the bottom line has to be, are we going to be accountable to God? This is the part that some people, I, I counsel anger issues. And most anger issues come from hurt and pain that happened in childhood. And if the adult comes to adulthood and never works through that hurt and pain, 
they can have their anger be the weapon that they hurt everybody else with. And the Bible said, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you're around somebody for very long, if you're around me, and I'm just looking over my shoulder on this side, uh, I found that little bear uh, with the blanket on a 50% sale during Christmas time, and I've never took him out of the chair. And so uh, don't mind me. I still have some Christmas things around, and, and it's still February. Or well, it just finished being February, which was Valentine's and my birthday. And so I love red accents. So look past my decorations and focus on what I'm talking about. And I'm asking the question, what is God's truth? To be saved, it's not just a belief in God. The devils believe there's one God, and they tremble but they're not saved. First of all, we have to teach our children from the time they're small. We teach them about God and God's love and that he came in the form of flesh and died on a cross for us to save us from our sins. And we've got to portray that love. We're the first God with skin on. If you can accept that as parents, you're the first God with skin on because you are the authority figure and especially the father in the home. The father in the home represents, from a child's viewpoint, is going to have a great effect on how they look at their heavenly father. And it can. And if the father in the home is full of anger and strife and yells and screams and loses his temper all the time, they're going to feel like that their father in heaven that they hear about, and maybe even as they get older they receive the Holy Ghost, they felt him, but they're still going to, could be very much a distorted father god concept because the father representative in the home was full of anger all the time the bottom line of what i felt in my heart when i felt like i needed to talk today is to say are we being accountable to god for how we treat other people we're all created equal god created each one of us you go to psalms 139 i talk about it all the time that we are created by God. We're not supposed to be anyone else than who we are. And I don't care what profession you have. I don't care. You don't compare yourselves among yourselves because God in the word of God says it is foolish. But this is something in our humanity we do. And that's impossible because from God's viewpoint, there's no comparison. There's not another Carol Theobald Clemens on earth. And there's not another you on earth. So what God is going to make me accountable for is where he placed me, what he's put in my heart, what I have sought to do, and have I done everything to the best of my ability to the glory of God. That's the bottom line of serving God. And if we're living with low self-worth that I call God-worth, You've got to kick that thought out of the door. There's no reason for you to feel that you don't have value because God created you to be you, not to be anybody else. We're all on the same level because God created us all, and guess what? He's going to judge us all. For those of us that are in the body of Christ, that are in the bride of Christ, born again of water and spirit. And I'm not talking about any organization now. I'm talking about the word of God. If we're born again according to Acts, the second chapter, and have our Pentecost experience, which we must have, because Jesus said in John, the third chapter, when Nicodemus came to him, he said, you must be born again of water and spirit. And when you read through the scripture, it said if you're not born again of water and spirit, you cannot see or be in the kingdom of God. And of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were the four gospels that led us into the history of the New Testament church. And their new birth experience was on the day of Pentecost. And we must be born again of water and spirit to be ready to go when Jesus comes. And that could be at any moment in the twinkling of an eye. God could come right now and take this church out. And I, I might be 75, but when I was nine years old, I received the Holy Ghost. And all the way through my teen years, I had to make a choice. Am I going to serve God or am I going to serve the devil? And that choice is still today. 
Just because I've had the Holy Ghost all those years doesn't make me super spiritual living on some spiritual cloud that my humanity never gets in the way. No, it's for all of us that we have to totally surrender to God. Totally surrender to Him. That's what we have to do. And so in that surrender, it's accountability to God. When I'm working with, if you're having marital problems and you're married, and you're at each other like this, you know what the problem is with that? Is that you don't have God in the middle of the situation. Because individually, we have to have God in our hearts, ruling and reigning, and letting the fruit, we have to allow, allow the fruit of the Spirit to work in our lives. God never forces us. He wants us to allow Him to be part. He said, draw close to me, and I will draw close to you. So He wants to allow us to be a part, Him to be a part in our lives and to control our thoughts that create our feelings and that how we act out. And you've heard me say before, if you've watched me teach, that it's the great commandment. He said, worship me, love me with all of your heart, soul, mind, and your strength. Your strength is your body. That's the only way I can serve God is through my body. And if I give him all my heart, soul, and mind, that's the invisible me the where I process my thoughts that create my feelings that then create my actions. This is a truth that people tell me they don't hear in the church the way I'm teaching it. And I just felt tonight I had to get on and I had to say something about this. If we're having conflicts in life, it's because we're not totally surrendered to God. Because the Bible says, as much as it lieth within me, I am to live peaceably with all men. That's anyone that's in my life. I am to live peaceably with all men. So if I'm not living peaceably, then I've got to challenge my heart. And one prayer that I pray a lot is the last two verses of Psalms 139. Search me, O God. I'm only responsible to him for me. Search me, O God, and know my heart. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me along the path of righteousness. I'm asking God to search my heart because I want to be saved. The devil is being relentless in pounding everybody with negative thoughts that create negative feelings or I, might, I call them toxic feelings. He wants us to be in the control of and acting out with our toxic feelings. But that's of the devil. And we have to rebuke that. And say, God, I want your peace to rule and reign in my heart. So then I can live peaceably with others. And what you are in the home is what you really are. It's not what people see at church. Or what you put on when you go to the job. It's just like anger issues. I was counseling a couple years ago, years ago, face-to-face -face in counseling office. And the man had horrible anger issues to the point he would knock holes in the walls. One time he pushed his wife out of the car while it was running down the road. And yet they lived in an apartment unit and he was telling me how much he goes around and witness to all the neighbors in the apartment. But they all hear him having a yelling match with his wife. So I asked him, I said, do you ever get angry? I said, do you have a job? He said, yes. I said, do you ever get angry on the job? And he said, yes. I said, well, can you yell and scream and knock holes in the walls there? Oh, no, because I would get fired. Now, he had been telling me that his wife was the cause of his anger. No, the wife was not the cause of his anger. People that have anger have got to search their hearts. The anger is not the sin because the Bible tells us, be ye angry, but sin not. So I teach people how to deal with their anger. But you know what? If they're not fully surrendered to God, then that's going to make them angry. Because if we fully surrender to God, in every area of our life, and it's a decision 
one moment at a time, one day at a time, one event at a time, one stress at a time, one conflict at a time. We have to choose to surrender to God because he wants all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Our strength is our body. He tells us in 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, that because we are the temple of the Holy Ghost or the house of God, that we are to glorify God in our body and our spirit, ours, which belongs to God. That means my attitude, the way that I talk to other people, the way that I interact with other people, because how we treat others is how we're treating God in two ways. Number one, it's for anybody because they're all created by God. Saved or unsaved, we're all created by God. So that's where we get our value because we're created by God. The world doesn't understand that. He bases it on our performance. We're created by God because, I mean, we have self-worth, they call it, because we perform in a way that they're happy about, and then they say that, okay, now we are have worth. But no, our worth and value comes because God created me, and then God became my Savior and offered me the gift of salvation. And now I'm his child. I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. See, what we are in the home, I've said it again, what you are as parents is what you really are. And then they're learning, the children are learning about God by watching how you interact with each other. And this is something, I'm going to post this and repost it. And I pray and pray that if you have children, you'll first listen to yourself and then you'll even let your children hear what I'm saying, because we're all accountable to God for every word that comes out of this mouth. We are going to answer to God. For those of us who are born again of water and spirit, we're going to go up in the rapture and we're going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's where God is going to pass out rewards. Some people that get there will have eternal life, but will have no rewards. I don't want to be those a pe person without rewards at all. I want to live my life to give him glory so when I make it to heaven that he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But the rest of the people that are putting God by the wayside, and this really, really touches my heart when I see people that are close to me, that I watch their lives, and God is not the center of. You don't hear God being talked about. You don't see any manifestation of God. And yet they'll claim, oh, I'm a Christian. Well, no, we have to be Christ-like when we're a Christian. I just, I am just almost beside myself on how I can try to get this truth of God across. Living for God to me is easy. When we surrender to the Holy Ghost, it's not hard to live for God. It's a joy that I have because I know something about prophecy. I know something about heaven. I've read the end of the book. I know that when God, and I'm going to jump through all the prophecy, and at the end, after the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to renovate this earth with fire and create a new heaven and a new earth. And we, the bride of Christ, and the Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints, which are different groups of people, are going to be ruling and reigning with him in the new heaven and new earth. We'll actually have bodies like his that could appear and disappear. We're going to be ruling and reigning with the Lord. Do your children know anything about that? Have you talked to your children about what's happening in the government and it's a fulfillment of scripture, which means the Lord could come at any time? Are you concerned? Do your children, have they been baptized? Have they got the Holy Ghost? Are you concerned? Are you concerned about yourself? Are you walking godly? Are you living godly? And I'm not talking about the outward. I'm talking about the heart. And bypass my fluffy hairdo. I wore a fluffy hairdo my whole life. And it's just part of me. I can't stand it down around my neck. And I've always worn it up. And it's just, it's changed through the years. But it's just me. I'm not asking anybody to wear a hairdo like mine. What I'm asking, God looks on the heart. I'm asking you what kind of spirit and attitude reigns in your home. You know, one thing I can say, my husband's been with the Lord now for a little over seven months. 
But I can look back on that 50 years of marriage and our years of raising our daughter and son. And their friends would love to come and stay in our home because they would specifically say, we feel love when we come here. Your home is peaceful. You know what? Because we were what I call Holy Ghost controlled. In fact, that came from my father who received this wonderful experience in 1925. 96 years ago. And I'm trying to teach my grandchildren the same thing that I'm talking to you about. I want my whole family saved. I want anybody that impacts or that comes in my life that God brings them in. I've got to speak the truth in their life. We can't be playing games with God. God wants all of us. What does that mean, all? It means everything about us. Everything we do. Everything we say. Everything we watch. The fun things. Are they pure in heart? Do we stop and say when we're going to watch a movie, is this going to be clean? Because Psalms tells us in Psalms 101 that I am going to walk with God with a perfect heart and I'll, let, I'll not let any evil come before my eyes. Are we going to live that? God is coming for a people that are without spot or wrinkle or any such thing in Ephesians the fifth chapter. I want to be ready to go. I love God and we can have, I've never, I've had all kinds of wonderful experiences in life. Living for God has not taken anything away. And the two things that I've said I never had had nothing to do with living for God. I always wanted a horse that I could be raised up with, but we lived in the city. And I always wanted to learn how to swim, but I was never around somebody that could teach me in privacy. So those two things have nothing about living for God, and that's the only two small disappointments I've had in life. But when I've read the book of Revelations, guess what? When the church comes back with God out of heaven, we're going to be riding white horses, literal horses we're going to be riding when he comes back and sets his feet on the Mount of Olives and sets up the thousand years of peace. I'm leaving a lot out, but I'm just saying my heart is thrilled to live for God. I love living for God. I love thinking about God. I love his word. I'm in his word. If you watch me on my Facebook page, Carol Theobald Clemens, where I'll post this. If you look on my ministry page, I repost. And a lot of times I have scriptures on a daily basis. Oh, I might post a picture. Some photographers are posting beautiful pictures of God's creation around the world. And when I see those, I have to repost them because they're just beautiful God's creation. If the things now that we see are beautiful, how much more beautiful is he going to make the new heaven and new earth? See, there's an excitement about living for God. And people that are around me that know me will tell other people, she loves to talk about God. She loves to talk about the word. It should be all of us that loves to talk about God. Not just because I'm in ministry of teaching. I just did a single seminar and it had nothing to do because I was single. But the sister that organized the, the seminar along with her pastor, she had been a widow for years. She's a younger, much younger woman and she had been a widow. She had a lot of things and, and we had counseled off and on for over two years. And she recently had called me in the fall and scheduled this singles conference that I was teaching about our God worth, about how we are special and we are complete in Him, using scriptures to help us to understand married, single, old, or young. We all have a special part in the kingdom of God. And the Bible even teaches that we all have been given a minister. We've all been given a gift of ministry, is how the Word of God says it. And that can just be encouraging one another. <clears throat> but our biggest our biggest gift is how we live our lives. The Bible said we're open book, read of all men. So I know I'm living my life. Now I live alone, but I'm not truly alone because God is with me. And that's what we have to think in everything that we're doing and saying God is here. How would God want me to do this? I just pray that that bottom line, I was telling a couple that the conflict that happens in the home is, is the devil's delight because he wants husband and wives to be against each other. He wants conflict. He is just um, 
as stronger than he's ever been in trying to destroy people's lives. And what we all must start with is our individual accountability with God. That's what my husband and I did for the 50 years that we were married. We went through all kinds of things in life, troubles and sorrows and disappointments. And that happens in this world. God says in this world, you shall have trouble, but be of good cheer because I have overcome. And that was before he died on the cross. He was speaking prophetically. And I've talked about that over and over. He did overcome. And that's what gives us the hope of the resurrection that no matter what the world does, I have a hope beyond this life. Romans 8 tells us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. So I don't care what you're going through tonight. If there's been abandonment, divorce, as I said, widowhood, I'm a widow now. I don't even, I was at that singles conference and the pastor, uh, I gave him my book on marriage, God's Design for Marriage. You can get it on my website or you can get it as a Kindle download from Amazon, God's Design for Marriage by Carol Clemens. And I gave him the book, and the next morning he was teaching in Sunday school out of the book. And he happened to say, who, are, who of you are married here? Because it was a singles conference, and people had stayed over for the conference. And that was before I was doing my speaking part. And I automatically raised my hand, and then as soon as it went up, it came down, because I thought, no, I'm not married. It's been over seven months, but I still feel married. But that's okay. But all of us can go through sorrow, sickness. I took care of my husband for nine months as sole caretaker 24-7. And I had to be on call 24 hours a day. And I didn't think I was going to make it. And I kept my ministry going of counseling reduced hours. But I still kept the counseling. But God somehow helped me and I survived. My husband is in heaven with the Lord. What a better place to be. I don't care what's coming your way. If you turn to God and you ask him to help you. I'm in the middle of decision making right now. And everything that I'm making, I'm saying, God, it's you and me. Now give me the wisdom to make these decisions the right way that I need to make them for the right outcome that you want to have happen. It's just inviting God into everything. What would God want me to do? as that young mother talks about on Christian radio, as she's leading her family of six, she says, and I'm repeating again, what would God want us to do about this? That's the bottom line. And individually, we need to be teaching our children that we individually are all going to account to God. Just because I'm saved didn't mean that my children were going to be saved. They had to make their own decisions to repent and get baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord filled them with his spirit. And we have to have that if we're going to go to heaven. And I feel with any time the Lord could come in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And there's nothing more important than getting into the word of God, reading the word of God. And a simple way you can do that is a family. Every husband is the pastor and priest of the home. And if you're a single parent, you're the pastor of the home. And what you can do with your family is go to the New Testament. And even if your children are young and you want them to hear the story of the book of Acts, go to Acts and maybe read one or two chapters at a time and talk about it. And talk about how real the experience is. Talk about your experience. You know, when Paul had his... Damascus Road conversion, that's what he talked about. He didn't have the New Testament. He wrote about half of the New Testament. So he didn't have the New Testament to refer to. He just talked about what Jesus did for him. And you know, that's what I talk about. I tell about my father coming to this wonderful truth when he was 15 years old in 1925 and how that changed his family, and how he brought that into his marriage, and how he taught that to us children, and how we're teaching it to our children. It is a true, living, exciting experience to walk with God, because we have hope beyond this life. We don't have to look around at all the terrible things that are happening, and especially in high government right now, all the decisions that are being made to take all morals out of society. Even one of the senators, I believe it was, or one of the House of Representatives said, if you're going to tell us anything about God or the Bible, we don't want to hear it. 
Those kind of people are leading our country today. We must pray for our country, pray for the leaders, but our hope is in God. And I, I just pray in this time that I am talking that you will share this with your family, that you'll be challenged yourself if your parents that are watching, husband and wives, understand you're called in different positions and you're going to be answered or you're going to have to answer to God, did you fulfill your position as a husband and a wife and not be in conflict but come together to complement each other in the Lord. And as Ephesians 5.21 says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Back to the daily devotions. It would only take 10 or 15 minutes if you would sit down with your children in the evening, sometime possibly after dinner, get them off their devices and their phones and their iBooks and their, their whatever they have, their iPads, and say, we're going to have a Bible, a little bit of Bible teaching here. And start in the book of Acts and go to the epistles written by Paul and teach how to be saved and then take one or two chapters a night. Read them and talk about them and say, what's in here that we could apply to ourselves? The book of James is a wonderful place to start. It talks about the tongue. It talks about the power of the tongue, how it can set a whole forest on fire, and that's talking about emotional pain and hurt and damage to other people. I hope this stirs you up. I want to stir you up in the Holy Ghost to be living for God in that expectation that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. In that expectation, we want our hearts to be right. When I'm expecting company, I be sure that the bathroom is clean. I have my house clean. If I'm going to cook dinner, I have gone to the grocery store. I have decided what kind of dinner I'm going to make and the process I'm going to make it in. Looking in the expectation of the company. Well, we need to be living like that in the spirit realm. In the expectation, you need to put it in your children's hearts. Live for God today, kids, because the Lord could come before you get home tonight and we'll see each other in heaven. If you keep putting that into their hearts, then guess what? What we feed ourselves is what we become. And we as family, as parents, as grandparents, we need to be the leaders that are talking about the Lord, bringing the godly principles in and talking about what is sin and what is not sin because if we don't teach them, the world is going to teach them. I hope I've stirred you up. Again, I'm Carol Clemens with Life Enrichment Ministries. I've been teaching the Word of God over 60 years. I've been counseling uh, 28 years, and the last 16 has been by phone, and it's by FaceTime, by Skype, and I haven't uh, done, what's the other one? I can't even think of it right now, but all of the possibilities on the Internet that, and I've taught and I've actually uh, counseled and taught over Skype to Canada and to Sweden and to Guam and other countries because of the technology that we have. I use it for his glory. But be stirred up. Jesus is coming. And the bottom line, are we ready? And are we encouraging those around us to get ready and to be living holy as he is holy just by surrendering to him? So again, carolclemens.org. I also have YouTube channel. If you just put Carol Clemens in YouTube, my channel will come up. If you want to help support my ministry at $6 a week, you can go to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. And I have tons of teachings on there, probably over 50 now. And one of 10 of those are teaching from a book that I don't even have published yet, which is called God's Healing for Hurting People. My book that's published is God's Design for Marriage. And the one that's not published yet is God's Healing for Hurting People, but I have it on Patreon where I read the book and I gave commentary. I want to stir up the gift that lieth within you and realize that we can be excited about who Jesus is at any age because I was started teaching when I was 14 in Sunday school. And my father taught me how to study and how to get the Word of God. I had the Holy Ghost and I taught the little children and I've been teaching ever since. And God is great and he's greatly to be praised. I'm looking for him to come at any moment. Yes, he's coming and he's coming soon. And we all need the Lord and we need to be accountable to him individually to give him glory. So God bless you all and be stirred up in the Holy Ghost.
In Jesus' name.